um, thank you all for for being on this this afternoon to talk about you know how how we collectively can help support your student athletes during what ultimately is is a bit of a confusing time in the recruiting process. Um, my name is Max. I'm from Head First. We'll do intros in just a little bit. But the the point of this webinar and, and in talking with you know coaches like you guys is that you're on the front lines talking with families, talking with student athletes through this process. And while we are not necessarily experts in every single thing that's going to be happening. We've kind of drawn in this PowerPoint and in this presentation, drawn on some of the networked connections to travel coaches like you guys, college coaches, et cetera, um, to essentially to provide some resources, some thoughts, questions, action items, and resources, most importantly, for travel coaches like yourself uh, to help support their, their student athletes right now. Um, so, before we dive into too much of those types of things, why don't we do some quick introductions? Matt, could you start us off? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> my name is Matt Sternberg. I, I see some familiar names on here, so good to see you guys. For those that don't know me, I'm the Director of Business Development for um, the Head First Honor Roll Camps, as well as the Top 96 Softball Camps. Um, really excited to be able to talk to you guys, as Max said, a little bit more about how could be unprecedented times that we're in, what you can be doing, um, what we've been hearing from, from folks like you uh, to be able to offer some value to your kids as well as you know what we can be doing with you this summer. Uh, I've had the, uh, the pleasure of you know, talking with thousands and thousands of families in my five plus years, um, helping navigate and working with travel coaches and families to get kids recruited and looking at continuing to do the same thing, although certainly the uh, the landscape will be a little bit different this summer. Absolutely, thank you. And and my name, as I said, is Max McKenna. I'm our senior manager of marketing here for uh, Head First Honor Roll Camps as well as Top 96 Softball Camps. I was a college athlete on the baseball side. I played at Amherst College where I graduated in 2011. Then once upon a lifetime ago, went into teaching and coaching uh, at a couple at the high school level, a couple private schools in New England on coaching baseball, teaching history. I've also worked with um, summer travel teams across the board in terms of coaching certainly in player development, but also uh, recruiting advising for especially 18U and 16U teams as they uh, kind of get underway in their recruiting process. I've been now back at Head First full time, I guess, six years coming up on coming up on six years. Um, so it's, it's been a while and I always take great pleasure in connecting with coaches like you guys and no offense, more importantly, your student athletes as they uh, embark on this process. So we kind of have this overall PowerPoint this presentation divvied up into a couple different sections, um, what student athletes can do, what travel coaches can do, and then some of the NCAA type questions and recruiting impacts of everything that's going on with a suspended college season and an NCAA dead period dropped in the middle of uh, the middle of the spring season. So the, the kind of shifting landscape. First, we want to touch on the, the key things that we believe your, your student athletes can be doing right now, some very obvious, some some less so, some uh, more counterintuitive. Number one um, seems obvious to say, but has to be to stay healthy, just in terms of generally being prepared for whenever this does open back up again, in terms of having a travel ball season, having a recruiting cycle, uh, staying healthy is going to be really important to that. Um, and so, you know, following the, the guidelines that are in place in your area, very important, um, but then also continuing to do the things that you can while maintaining social distance and while maintaining a uh, work from home or telework or, or remote classroom type uh, lifestyle, continuing to move forward with um, your physical development. So continue home workouts. Um, and one article that I was reading earlier today quotes Tim Corbin, the head baseball coach at Vanderbilt, you know, he's talking about his kids uh, developing from home. They can do a lot of primitive things. <laughs> There's a lot of things you can do with your body if you move it outside and if you got some creativity. So for my money, if a national championship baseball team can do it, I think high school student athletes can also use some of this to, to keep getting better. It's about finding some of those resources, which we'll um, talk about uh, as well uh, later on. Next up, a really important piece of this is the academic side of things. Transitioning to a 
distance learning or remote classroom paradigm for a lot of student athletes can be really, really difficult not having the actual physical structure of a classroom or seeing your classmates, teachers, administrators face to face. I know that it's something that when we talk about it head first, we're all working remotely, as you might be able to tell from uh, from the background that Matt and I are in front of. It can be very difficult to maintain the social aspect of what you're doing and also maintain that discipline and, and stay in some of the habits that set these student athletes up for success when they are attending a school. How do they keep or adapt or maintain some of those same habits uh, working from their own living room to keep the foot on the gas in the classroom? Because I think that one thing in talking with families and student athletes recently, there's a feeling among some of them that this is an interruption or a disruption, which it certainly is. But you're going to these student athletes are going to get grades for the spring semester in almost all cases. And they're going to submit those to college coaches, to college admissions departments. So as much as it can feel like you are out of your normal rhythm, it's really important that ball players and, and students really keep their foot on the gas in the classroom and keep doing the things that they need to do, even though it looks very different. Their day-to-day -day is going to look very different, but they still need to set up and establish some of the same rhythms and habits that they can have so that they can be successful. The other side of this is, um, and I'll, I'll turn this over to Matt in a second to talk about this specifically, but this does create some dedicated time to prepare for SAT and, and ACT standardized testing. Um, for better or for worse, good or bad, whatever your feelings on it are, these standardized tests are a really important piece of a coach getting a good academic picture of a ball player. And so having this maximized. Doing the best that you can as a student athlete on the standardized test can be really important to help unlock some of those doors at the college level. And right now where you might have a bit more time in front of your computer or you know, you're not driving the 20 minutes, 30 minutes to school, you have, you get some of that extra time back in your day to dedicate towards SAT and ACT um, prep work. Um, and also going hand in hand with this, just as schools are being disrupted by this, there also are impacts on the standardized testing brought on by COVID-19. One resource that we turn to, as you see here up on the screen, is our friends at Compass Education Group. Uh, this is a, an honor roll father who founded this company uh, uh, about 10 years ago, I believe. Um, and there they have this running article on here are the impacts, here is what's changed with testing dates or what's been canceled or what's been rescheduled or updated or what's the change to the AP exams. So staying in touch with these sorts of resources is something that we believe is really important. Matt, could you tack on a little bit there about um, that SAT standardized test prep? Yeah, absolutely. And just to back up to kind of lead into that, I think the biggest thing right now is complacency on all of these things that you just mentioned. It's very easy to just say, man, I, I give up. I don't want to deal with this. This is this is not my routine. This is not my rhythm. And I think we're all feeling that pain. I know I am working from you know, home right now with my dog that could bark any minute and that's going to interrupt this entire thing. But I think what's <clears throat> excuse me, what's important is the fact that you can control what you can control. You can control the controllables. And I think for all three of these, there's no excuse to be at your best because everybody's going to be at a level playing field. So whether that's getting in the right workouts um, and doing what you can from home, um, certainly from the academic side, which is, again, what Max said, most kids, most families, like they're gone 13, 14 hours a day. They're on the road with, with softball or they're doing other extracurriculars. Those have been taken away. So use the time that you have, use it wisely. And I think the, the the key here is they listen to you. They may not listen to us. They don't they they don't have that trust as they do, you know, that they have with their their travel organization or their high school coach. I think that's what's really important is they can dedicate their time for things like SAT. There's a lot of really good free resources online that folks can take great practice tests, learn different tricks, be able to take some, you know, 15, 30, 30 minute courses that are available. Those are really important, as Max said, as much as you know, people want to believe it or not, that is what a lot of these high academic schools are looking for. So now let's let's get rid of the excuse train and really focus in on what we can do. Absolutely. And, and it's proven many times over that having access to prep work and practice tests you can train for these standardized tests. And so using this opportunity, as Matt said, using those hours that you might gain back in your day towards this is something that we're certainly encouraging student athletes to do so that when the time comes, when they're in front of coaches, wowing them with their, you know, they're playing on the softball field, are they also then gonna look down at their sheet and say, 
oh wow, like that's the that's the academic profile that I'm that I'm looking for at, at my program. Um, third kind of part of this this three legged stool in terms of what student athletes can do is specific to recruiting. Um, right now, there's we're in a dead period. Um, but I think that oftentimes with student athletes, there's a misperception about what a dead period means. And they look at it, they say, all right, dead period, I guess there's nothing that I can do, which simply isn't the case. And there's a lot of things that student athletes can be doing right now to advance their recruiting for when this dead period lifts, whether it's on April 15th, as is currently slated, or whether it's, you know, June 1st or somewhere in between, depending on how, how long uh, things go on. Some of the things that we focus on in this vein are school list research. Um, we believe very firmly that the ultimate win in the recruiting process is to find the best overall and holistic fit for your college experience. And so an important piece of finding that fit is A, defining what qualities you are looking for in a school, and then finding schools that match those qualities. And so right now is an opportunity for girls to do that who otherwise would be very busy in this in the spring season um, one thing that i think about a lot and talk with the spring sport athletes specifically about is spring sport athletes are kind of at a disadvantage quite frankly when it comes to pieces of their recruiting uh process because they are for all sports, there's a lot of exposure uh, and recruiting opportunities over the summer. But if you're a fall sport athlete, you have that spring season to build out your school list, lay the groundwork of communicating with coaches, make sure you have all their contact info, have your video all set and polished and perfect and have your profile up to date. All those things that if you're busy playing your sport during the spring season, it's a lot harder. And so once you get to June 1 or wherever your spring season ends, you're rushing to get all these things done. I would encourage girls to, instead of, you know, getting that time back that they had on the softball field, which it hurts, it's it's painful to have your season suspended, but use those hours that you got back in your day and week and dedicate it to these sorts of things that can pay dividends once this dead period does lift off. So do your research on your schools, um, get in touch with the coaches at your, uh, at your target programs, because even though this is a dead period, you can still, as a 2020 or a 2021, you can still be in touch with coaches and send them an email, send them your profile, send them your video, your transcript. And we'll talk a little bit about that in more detail later. If you're a 2022 or 2021, you also are still allowed to do these things. You can send your profile, you can send your video or transcript or standardized test scores if you have them early. You can send those to college coaches. It's just that division one schools won't be able to respond to you in kind. They will send back a form email that says, please fill out our recruiting questionnaire and here are the dates of our camps. We can't talk to you about recruiting specific conversations until September 1st of your junior year. So that doesn't mean that they aren't looking at the video or reading your transcript or putting you in their funnel. So it's important to reach out to them no matter what and get in their inbox and get on their radar. And then also if they say, hey, here are our camps and here's our recruiting questionnaire, fill out their recruiting questionnaire. It's free. It'll help put you in their system so that you receive updates if, um, if they add a camp or if they change a camp, whatever it is. And then think about, is this the type of prospect camp that I should go to? Am I looking hard enough at Amherst College to go attend their camp specifically, where it's going to be just, you know, just Johnson and that program. And, and is that a worthwhile experience for me? Um, the last bit here is to update or create, if you don't haven't already, an online profile and to update your video. Uh, a partner that we work with on the profile side is a company called Sports Recruits. Um, and what they are, I'm pulling up my sample profile here just so you can kind of get a gist of how it works. Um, but this is a, it's a free to create a profile. There are um, kind of different upsells that you can use that give you added functionality, but the core functionality of this update, or, um, uploading your transcript, uploading video, all that stuff is all free. This is a free profile. I obviously was, as a 31 year old, I'm not gonna, not gonna pay for a profile here, um, but you can have all this. The key here is A, it means that student athletes only have to update their information in one place. If you have a new transcript, great, you're only going to one place to update it. If you have new video, great, you only have to update it one place. You upload it here, you can upload as many videos as you want. They have a built-in video editor. There's a lot of tools here that you can use. And then you can just send a single landing point to coaches. So instead of sending, you know, Lacey Wood from Harvard, these seven attachments, and then Jen Williams from Dartmouth, these eight attachments, because they wanted one additional 
personal narrative or something like that. All of it can live in one place and you can just send that out. You update it one place, send coaches to one place and it can really, um, really help you uh, gain some efficiency in at least the information and communication with college coaches as well. Max, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of points. If you just if you want to go back there for one second, yeah. there, what, what's really important um, of what on the recruiting side is, unfortunately, these college coaches they have a little bit more time now, and I think that's what's really key. Is in the spring, you never were really going to get somebody unless you were one of their top prospects, and they have an assistant or their head who's able to communicate with you over email or social media. Now they do have a lot more time, so. They're looking at things. They're throwing people on their whiteboard, seeing who may fit in. And so the time is now, as we said earlier, you can control the controllables. That is something that you are able to do. So get out there, make sure your kids are emailing, emailing with a reason. Um, I think, you know, while their eyes are paying attention to it, they're going to get inundated with a lot, but try to stand out throughout. And we have some tips on that through some of our blog posts as well that, that we will continue to share with you. So. Absolutely. And I think that, that that is a really important piece, right? These coaches are trying to figure out what they can be doing with all of this newfound free time. And yes, they were disappointed, devastated that they that they had their season suspended. But I happened to hop on a, on a recorded Zoom call with um, Chris Gordon, the assistant baseball coach at Duke, and he's losing his mind because he isn't doing what he is used to be doing every day. And he is looking for different things to do. Those things that he's looking at are how can I digitize my recruiting and look at these profiles? How can I look at every video that comes into my inbox or comes into our recruiting questionnaire? How can I look at these profiles the most efficiently? So while they have more time in front of their computers, because that is what they have right now, they have more time to do administrative uh, and, and recruiting work on, on the internet and with um, their inbox. Use that to your advantage as a student athlete to get in front of them right now while they are looking. Uh, the next bucket that we'd like to touch on is what coaches can do. Um, you guys are incredible resources to your student athletes, and we just kind of want to talk about what some of the things that we have seen coaches doing right now that we think has really added some value. And one of them is filter sources to give your players the best info that they can get. Right now, there's all sorts of information across the internet about drills you can do in your living room or NCAA impacts of COVID-19 or here's how it's going to impact 2021s and 2022s and it's going to impact recruiting forever. And there are some really good articles and some really good sources and there are some that aren't so good or aren't that thoroughly vetted or are an interpretation but aren't necessarily speaking to the facts of the matter as they stand right now. So. You guys as coaches have a, a filter on these things that student athletes and parents don't by virtue of your experience in this space. So what I would encourage coaches to do is to be this filter, actively be this filter for your families, whether that means, you know, curating, doing a weekly digest of here are the relevant articles or blog posts or videos that I've read or seen over the last week that I think can help my families be set up. Great, here they are. And this can be stuff about uh, workouts that really are specific to softball and that you can do in a confined space with minimal equipment, or it could be about NCAA and recruiting or anything in between. But I think that providing that filter to these families is really, really important now, um, just given the volume of information in the space as people are trying to figure out what's going on. Um, the other thing here is we talked a lot about how student athletes should be doing their school research and starting to set their sites and build out their school list. You guys as coaches can also help assist in that. If, you know, if I'm not necessarily a power five softball player, but you look at my list, you say, hey, hey, Max, I want to check out the list of schools that you're looking at. And I show you all power five schools and you're like, "Ooh, that might not be the softball ceiling that, that you have right now. Being that reality check for players in their college selection process and also being a support system for the college coach communication. This is something that I think coaches and parents can share in to proofread emails and vet the list of schools and make sure that they might be the types of softball programs and academic institutions that these uh, that your student athletes would be would be happy in. But I think that being a support system in that can be really, really important because you guys have seen girls go through this process and you have helped girls to all these different softball programs all over the country and seen the success that they've had. 
So you have a bit more kind of uh, longitudinal study, if you will, of what it takes to play at some of these places and also what it takes to be happy in college at some of these places. And so bringing that experience and that, that depth of knowledge to bear on a 16 year old going through this process for the first and only time can really help set them up for success in that. And Max, <clears throat> one other piece on the resource side is parents more than ever are craving some structure for themselves. And I think, I'm sure you're seeing it. We are definitely seeing a lot of panic, a lot of concern about the process. Um, and I think this is a really nice way to be able to say, it's okay, we're gonna, everybody's on the same, you know, like I said, level playing field. Here's how we're gonna get over it. And this is the way that we're gonna do. So it really does add a lot of value. And that's what we're seeing from a lot of our partner programs now, which we'll get into on social and other ways that they're really getting out there. And it is making people feel as though, okay, we can control it and let's go ahead and do it. So um, just some, some good stuff that we've seen from, from some of you guys actually, so. Absolutely, and, and that brings us into kind of the digital presence. Um, you know, you can't have a team practice right now, almost anywhere, um, or there might be limited access to cages or facilities or equipment or whatever the case may be. Building a digital presence for your programs so that they have some of the resources that they can go back to, I think can really help set them up to continue making strides in their softball, even while they are more stuck at home or have more limited resources at their disposal. Specifically, I think that workouts and drills and having some sort of, we've seen it on the baseball side and on the softball side, having some sort of program Instagram feed or YouTube channel where you can come compile and then distribute effective drills so that you can have your pitchers still, you know, working on spinning things or infielders working backhands. Like what are the techniques that they can do and the drills they can do in a confined space to still continue to improve at softball? Because the while this is an interruption to the to the softball development process, you can still keep your feet moving as a player during this time and come out ahead of where you entered it. The only way that you're gonna come out of this um, the same is if you don't do anything. And so we're really encouraging student athletes and coaches to focus on, okay, what can I do? What is the next step I can take with confined space, with limited equipment, limited resources? Can I work on my backhand technique by throwing a tennis ball off my, off my parents' living room wall without driving them crazy? Or I agree to limit it to only an hour and a half a day, whatever the case may be. Um, but I think that having a digital presence uh, can help you guys curate and then communicate that out and push that out to student athletes. The other really important thing here, which is a, a really good point that Matt brought up as we were um, talking through this over the last week or so, is team bonding and culture. Um, the social paradigm of a remote classroom is very different. I mean, it's something that with our head first team members, Matt and I miss it every day, not sharing the office with them. Your student athletes have some of the same the same feelings and the same obstacles that they're dealing with. They're not in the classroom with their friends. They're not in the dugout with their teammates. So what can you do as a coach to help facilitate the building of team culture, whether it's a, a whole team FaceTime or Zoom meetup or something like that, and also doing some small group and one-on-one -on -one check ins with players just to kind of, you know, take their temperature and how they're dealing with things because it is so different. Um, now, they obviously have great resources at home and their parents are guardians in most cases. And so that certainly helps them. But having a an outside sanity check from a teammate, from a coach, I think can really go uh, a really long way right now in, in helping these kids not feel socially isolated. I was listening to this thing the other day about college students and how they are dealing with remote classroom. And they made the, the very important distinction that what they are focusing on, focusing on is physical distancing, but not social distancing. You still want the social interaction but it has to take place in a different uh, context and format, obviously. It has to be a digitally based social interaction, but you still have that social appetite and you still need um, some of that interaction. And so being a platform and being a source of that, I think can really help kids right now. Um, and the last thing here is social media engagement for players and, and coaching staff. This kind of ties into those those first two as well. Having a social media channel where you are pushing out drills or pushing out, you know, your, your team culture initiatives is great. The other thing that I would encourage you is, you know, as the president of an organization or one team's head coach, whatever it is, you don't need to be doing this alone. And so talking to your organization as a whole to engage the entire coaching staff, if and when possible, I think can really help on a number of levels. A, it's gonna help keep your coaching staff more engaged and involved, even during this time when they aren't going to practices every day with you or whatever the case may be. Um, and also, if I'm on a 15U team and the founder of the organization is the only one that I'm seeing on social media, 
I'm thinking, where's, where's my coach? You know, I can, I can maybe engage the entire organization if I have one appearance from the 13U uh, pitching coach and then one appearance from the 18U hitting coach and kind of mixing up those voices can help facilitate both player and coach engagement uh, to really keep everybody on the same page when they aren't all in the same place. Now, when it comes to these digital resources and using it, I, what I don't want to try to convey is that, you know, coaches need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of online resources that are excellent. One of them that, that, uh, that you've probably heard of or interacted with is NFCA. And NFCA has a digital education library. They have drills and videos. They have some of this stuff that can really make your job easier. Um, you don't need to reinvent how you coach softball, right? That's, that's not the point of this. You're just saying, okay, I'm taking this drill and maybe I need to need to adapt it to a living room instead of a, you know, instead of the, the, the pitching circle, or I need to adapt it X, Y, and Z for equipment or for facilities. But um, having to adapt things is different than having to completely reinvent them. So using these drill and skill uh, resources, I think can really help you guys, again, be a good resource to your, to your players. And there are plenty of other ones as well. I mean, one that comes to mind on Instagram feed that I follow very closely is like the package deal. Now they have a lot of stuff that is, that shows the drills on their feed. They also have some paid courses that, um, if you're feeling up to it and want to, you know, enroll the, in those or enroll your student athletes in those, whatever it may be, uh, transitioning some of this to a digital learning platform is something that I think this creates the opportunity for coaches to do so that they can uh, effectively engage with their players right now. The other thing on this is I don't want to leave you guys as coaches out of this either. Yes, your players need to continue to develop, but you're not on an island. And so having resources like NFCA or like this coaching community, how can you pull on that to, sure, get tactically more ideas for what drills I can do with my players, but also I need some inspiration. I'm, I'm a little, I'm at home. I'm with my family. I'm not feeling as connected to my community of softball players or softball coaches. How can I engage with that, um, with that community? How can I look for education and professional development opportunities while I have some extra time on the couch in front of my computer? So thinking about what these online resources might be for you or for your community or who in your network you can go to, whether it's a local college coach, a college coach on the other side of the country, other travel programs, mentors, whatever it is, pull on some of those as you go through um, for both the good ideas that uh, you know many heads can, can lead to better ideas, but also for that inspiration, for that connection back to the softball community as well. And then the last thing, and this is kind of the, maybe the elephant in the room, is the other thing that we believe coaches can do right now is start thinking through some contingency planning for their summer schedules. Um, unfortunately, due to everything going on and it seems likely to continue at least for the short and medium term, this summer will not look like the summer that you penciled out nice and nice and neat on your calendar when you were scheduling tournaments this past October, November, December, January, whenever that was. Um, some of these are going to be postponed. They're going to be moved. They're going to be canceled. There are going to be things that happen. And so starting to think through the different contingencies that you and your program and your team has um, to still make sure that you're delivering a great softball experience is something that um, that, that we think is important at this time. It's something that we at Head First are doing when it comes to, to our events. Right now we're planning on running all of them, but we're also starting to think through, okay, what is the just in case scenario and how can we best serve the student athletes and the coaches in our, uh, in our network and in our community? Um, one thing with relation to this is that we believe that right now, programs that are meant to give recruiting exposure to their, to their ball players are going to need more than ever uh, efficiency in, in the exposure that they're getting. It's um, being able to target the right schools at the right time for the right student athletes is going to be more and more important because this summer recruiting calendar could get truncated. It could get shortened on one end or the other. And so thinking about, okay, how can I best use my team's time during this window? That's going to be really, really important. I think it's always important, but it's really doubling down on it this year, given the potential for um, kind of schedules being up in the air and being shifted around. The other side of things as well is that, and this came out of the conversation that I had with Chris Gordon, the Duke assistant baseball coach, is accessing video, data, and, and analytical tools, you know, things like Blast, Trap, Soto, TrackMan, whatever the, the case may be, um, 
those also can be more important this summer because what they can do is give coaches more in-depth knowledge and insight into your players um, during what might become a, a shorter time horizon. So um, if they only have a few months to do all of their recruiting and they see you play once, what are the other tools that they can use to get a good picture of a student athlete? And it's video and it's data so that they can watch you play and they have that eye test, but then also they say, okay, here's what I saw when I watched this girl play. Here's the data that lines up with that. And it tells me even more about who she is as a player and how she can contribute to my program. Um, and, and video kind of helps in that same direction. The other thing that came up during this is, as I was talking through this with, with Chris, he said, we understand as college coaches that when we first see kids play this summer in a tournament, it might be the first live pitching or live hit ball that they've seen since the beginning of March. And so, yes, we're still going to be watching and we're going to be taking notes on, on how we perceive your play, but that data is going to be more and more important because everybody is liable to come out of this looking and feeling rusty on the softball field. So how does the data, uh, how can you use that data and that analysis to indicate and to, to gain insight into the potential or the recruitability or the projectability of players beyond just how they performed on a certain day with two eyeballs on you and you hadn't seen live pitching in, in three months? What are the what's the depth of information that I can get about that player beyond that? And so it's going to be more and more important for efficient recruiting exposure and also access to these sorts of tools and platforms um, to give coaches a good idea of what they are looking at and what girls can contribute to their program. Now, the other side of things, and this kind of comes from the, the NCAA perspective, and one question that we started to get a lot from parents of our alumni as well as coaches that we work with is, how is this going to impact the 2020 grads who just you know, are wrapping up their high school careers and just came out of my travel ball program and are committed to attend X, Y, or Z school in the fall. And also, what about my 2021s who might, might may or may not have a verbal commitment? Um, now, the difficulty around this is that there is a possibility for a series of effects coming from NCAA decisions that haven't been made yet. Um, my understanding is that they'll have a meeting on Monday, on March 30th, uh, at the Division I Council level to uh, decide some of these further um, kind of further mandates that will come down from the NCAA. On, I guess it was two days after they canceled the postseason play and canceled the spring sports seasons, they came out and said, you know, essentially we're, we're looking at eligibility waivers for all student athletes. It was pretty vague, it was not definitive, and it didn't cover whether that was gonna be just seniors, if it was all student athletes, somewhere in between. And so a lot of things kind of trail from that decision. When it comes to eligibility extensions, will it only be this year's seniors? Will they have a fifth year of eligibility? Or will it be all student athletes? Or there are some sources that are saying that there are major conferences who would rather nobody get an eligibility extension from budgeting standpoint. So there's a lot of chips that have to fall on this one, and then this impacts other things. The second one right there being roster size impacts. Um, softball is different than some other college sports in that there isn't a hard cap on softball rosters dictated by the NCAA. But, you know, if you look at most rosters, they're in the 15 to 21, 22 player range. And so if you have eligibility extensions for seniors or for, for um, all the student athletes who are in college this spring, how does it impact roster size? And then how does that cascade and impact things like playing time for 2020s who are just getting on the campus? If the roster all of a sudden is 25 or 30 girls, what does that look like in that program moving forward? The other thing is if rosters are bigger, you know, these teams are, are capped at 12 scholarships. So what does that look like um, if eligibility is extended? Is that senior who is sticking around for next year who's on a 50 or 75 percent scholarship, does that still count? Are they now limited in the scholarships, more limited than they were in the scholarships that they're giving to 2020s? Does it cascade down to 2021s, et cetera? Um, and this ultimately will impact the class of 2020 and also the class of 2021s at the very least with the potential to impact 22s and beyond. Now, the good news for 2020s is that if they are committed to a Division I school and they have money behind it, then they have an NLI, which the NCAA does recognize as a binding document. So there, I would be very, very surprised if there were 
decommits happening in the 2020 class because that class is made up, it's admitted, it's signed, it's signed, sealed, delivered. Where there might be a little bit more risk is in the class of 2021 where they have verbal commits. Verbal commitments are crucial to the ecosystem of softball, of college softball recruiting. They're incredibly important and also they're common practice but the NCAA doesn't recognize verbal commitments as a binding agreement. And so they, when they are thinking about this, they are not saying, oh, you know, Duke softball already has this many girls committed for 2020 and also has this many girls committed for 2021. They're saying Duke softball has this many girls committed for 2020. And then as far as in the NCAA's eyes, as far as they're concerned, the 2021 class is is empty, is, is blank, because there aren't any signed, sealed, delivered uh, commitments in that same way. And that's where there might be some, you know, some risk. Um, it ultimately comes down a lot to the relationship that student athletes have with the coach that recruited them. But this is, and, and that's, that's always the case, even in times of everything working perfectly, but it is doubling down on that right now. So it's it's something that we are certainly keeping an eye on, but that ultimately it's very tough to know exactly what this will look like for 2020, 2021s, 2022s and beyond until some of these further decisions come down from the NCAA, which ultimately will impact all these different pieces of the puzzle. Now, Matt, we kind of talked about um, the summer scheduling and everything like that. Do you want to talk a little bit about kind of our events and and specifically what we might be doing with with travel coaches to help them and their families during this time? Yeah, but I think the biggest thing is what you said, uh, you know, about 10, 15 minutes ago is that the summer is it's not going to look the same no matter what. We, we do think there's going to be some interruptions that are there. So being efficient with your recruiting is something that you know, again, this is not personal to anyone, but we, we owe it to the kids to really make sure that we're sending them and signing up for, you know, the right events for, for where they are. It could be a specific tournament. It could be a specific prospect camp. It could be something like Head First or Top 96, but making sure that every single day that we are able to get out there, that we are giving them the right tools to be able to go off, get on these, you know, on the coaches radars um, to be able to ultimately sign with them when the new norms come out. Um, head first, you know, we we plan on running all of our events on the head first and top 96 side. Obviously, that is to be determined, but we are going full steam ahead. Um, and one of the things that we are offering to all of our families and all of our travel teams that we work with is we are able to refund them um, if our events are canceled or altered um, in, in a certain way where they're not able to attend. Um, so that's really important, which is something that we normally don't do, which is allowing families to be able to go ahead and sign up in an uncertain period, knowing that it's OK if the event, you know, we're not able to run it, they can get that back. Two is, you know, what I've reached out to many of you and some we're actually are working together um, is our uh, travel team rates and our specific organizational rates that we have. So because of the fact that all our events are certainly premium, um, there's a reason for it and we see such great results out of the kids that come through both of our camps. One of the things that we are able to do is lower that cost down, um, depending on the, uh, the the rate that we're able to get you, which I'm, I'm more than happy to, to follow up on. With that, we can also put down a very small deposit. So for example, top 96, you can put down a $96 deposit that is to be refunded if we don't run the event and your next payment can be about a month before the actual camp event. So allows for some you know, who have finan uh, financial, um, you know, uncertainties, we can go ahead and make that a little bit easier for them while still giving them the tools so they can attend a camp like this because we're confident, or hopeful that these events and others will run, but we do know that it's going to be a, a, a pretty tight window. So what we'd love to do is follow up with you after. If there's questions now, obviously, you can uh, go ahead and, and use that uh, on the toolbar. Um, and we can go ahead and answer some of those, but um, we are looking forward to making sure that we get you guys taken care of and whether that is for your higher academic kids that want to go to an Ivy League school, um, a school like Stanford or Duke on, you know, Stanford on the West Coast or, or Duke over here in the Southeast um, or some of the smaller schools we have you covered. And then in the top 96 range, which is more of our, our local showcases. So in Dallas, having schools like Baylor and Texas A&M um, or our DC schools with JMU and um, GW and Georgetown, those types, uh, we can certainly do that as well. 
Absolutely, yeah. And um, I, I didn't cover this at the beginning, but there is a question to have that I know a handful of you have already found, and we're now going to dedicate the rest of this. We got about 20 minutes or so left. If we fill all that, we are more than happy to. Um, but if you have any questions, there's a little questions tab over in the GoToWebinar toolbar. Feel free to um, to type it on in there, and we will make sure that we um, that we answer it. So first question coming in, Madam and Tim's run over to you. If the family or player has to cancel, are we is that same refund in effect, or is it if we cancel the camp due to uh, you know the effects of COVID nineteen and us not being able to operate the the events? It's a good question. Um, the short answer is it would be if head, head first or top ninety six needs to cancel. However, what you need to understand is we run programming starting at three years old here in DC. Certainly not baseball and softball yet. Um, we are the proud provider of the Washington Nationals and five other teams as well. And then we run our honorable camps. So safety, you know, the stakes couldn't be higher. We are always going to put that as number one, two, and three as our priority. So if we can't run the event, it's more than likely, uh, or excuse me, if you can't make it to the event, it's more than likely that nobody's going to be able to make it. We're not going to hold it if it's slightly safe to be able to go. Um, that's the reason why we have that in place. So to clarify, the refund would certainly be if we have to cancel the event for one reason or another, but we do have a very, very flexible credit policy where that could be then shifted for the next two years to anybody within the family. It could be transferred to a friend. So again, more stuff that gets, I mean, we could talk about that for 20 minutes that I can kind of get into more of a personal, um, you know, answer, answer on that for folks that are interested. Yeah, and, and just to, to tag in on that as well, I think that, you know, as I'm sure you've gotten 10,000 emails from every company you've ever bought anything from, we also, just as all they are, are monitoring the, monitoring the situation, right? Like that's the, the phrase you keep seeing. And it's, I mean, it's unfortunately true. This is a rapidly um, developing landscape day by day, week by week. And so we are keeping very close tabs on um, our, our partner facilities, our partner programs. Um, if the NCAA extends a dead period or if a certain uh, college is is saying, ah, you know, we're not going to get on the recruiting trail. Those are all the pieces of the puzzle that we are keeping our eyes on. And like Matt said, we are always going to come down on the side of the safety of our customers, our families, our coaches, and our own team, and that will always be the the priority that we that we set. Um, which is why we have done this and this refund policy in case we have to cancel. It's also why we have, as Matt alluded to, made our transfer and credit policy much more flexible in this year, given everything going on. So, it's something that you know will continue to evolve as the situation does as well. Max, I have one for you here yeah. um, if you want to take it. So um, it's regarding top 96 specifically being a local camp, typically with, you know, folks that are within the area and certainly the schools that are within the area. Is that something that you think will, um, you know, kind of gain a lot of traction in this summer period, given, you know, potential travel restrictions? I do. I mean, I think that that's a, that's a great question. I think that um, some numbers that when I looked them up, I know it blew my mind a little bit. 55% um, of, of uh, high school students go to college within 100 miles of home. That's really high. 80% of high school students go to college within 500 miles of home. So this regionality behind college selection process is real and it is backed up by years of data. Um, those numbers haven't changed all that much. Um, but especially in this summer, if you are looking in a region or if you are if there are you know flight difficulties or you know there's airline issues i think that local opportunities are going to be really really important this summer um having that national travel ball circuit is awesome and some of the best coaches and the best memories that i have ever had come from you know traveling to those tournaments that are really far away getting on the plane with your team and going that might be more difficult this summer, just given everything going on, we just don't know yet. Um, so having some local options where you can get exposure to 20 coaches all in one place, I think is a really good, uh, at, at the very least kind of safety net for student athletes who are looking to make ground, uh, make strides in their recruiting right now. Anything to add there, Matt? I agree with you. I, I think that's one of the main reasons why we operate a camp like that. I think there's also value in head first as well, given that we do see a lot of folks that are, you know, at least within state um, to be able to attend. So if college coaches are able to make it out there, 
um, it's going to be valuable because we just don't know about these larger tournaments that have 2,000 to 3,000 people in it, whereas our events are not very large. They're not, you know, 15 people, but the top 96 events are going to have anywhere from, you know, 50 to 75 people, whereas the honorable events are going to be anywhere from 150 to 175 in terms of kids. And then the, the coach ratios will, will vary based upon the camps. But I think that's what to is something to be looking out for this summer is those really, really large events may be a little bit more difficult to operate. Um, another question that came in, it's a, a, an excellent question, kind of getting to the nuance of the eligibility extensions and the possible ramifications stemming from that. Um, how do you see this potentially affecting the 2022 class in recruiting? If seniors only are granted further eligibility, does this change? And the shorter answer is, if seniors only are granted, yes, this does change. If only seniors are granted an extra year, then this essentially works its way through the system this next spring. So by a year from now, this will essentially have cleared the system. 2021 class, 2022 class will be essentially good to go with business as usual. If it extends it for everybody in college, then it doesn't work itself all the way through the system until this you know, 2020 freshman, this year's class. So the class of 2024 is through. And so it could have more lasting, um, more lasting ramifications on things like the size of the recruiting class, the size of the roster, and the availability of scholarships, either for one year or potentially for four years, just depending on what the NCAA um, decides around that eligibility waiver and extension. Um, again, it's, it's I'm, I'm not in the business to tell in the future, and I've heard from coaches and from, from experts more knowledgeable than I, I've heard arguments in both directions, and I've heard, you know, inside scoops and sources in both directions. So I can't say which one is going to going to happen, but as that shakes out, we will certainly be continuing to, to follow it. And also we'll be posting on our blog, on our social media with those updates so that our families and, and coaches like yourselves are um, best equipped with the answers for their parents and student athletes, who I know are asking some of these same questions too. Matt, any other questions that you see in there that, you, that you'd like for yes. us to take a shot at? I'm just, I just got one in here. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, this one was sitting in here, which we must have missed. But um, is there a certain number of uh, basically schools and coach participation, as well as players? I think it's important for us to be, you know, have to look to say, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't have a camp. I think, again, it goes back to if it's not safe for, for some, meaning if it's not safe for, for anyone to fly um, or, or, or travel, then more than likely we are not going to have an event. When it comes to more of the local camps, I think that's where we are able to have a little bit more leeway. Obviously, depending on what the restrictions are going to be from, you know, from a federal or from a state level are going to dictate what we do. But I do think that it's really going to be, you know, it's very, it's going to be very black and white. I think if nobody can go to the event, then obviously it's it's going to be canceled. But I don't think we're ever going to be in a situation where yeah, you know, 22 coaches can come, the others can't. So let's decide if we're going to have the event. Uh, that's my take on what this is going to look like. Um, but but I do think that um, we won't really be in that situation where you know we'll have to make that call. I think it's going to be a call that is uh, strictly based on safety. Anything to add, Max? Well, I think that based on safety and also based on NCAA, I mean, I think that a lot of these schools are going to take their cue from what the NCAA decides about extending or not extending this current dead period and what they're going to do about recruiting travel in the summer. Um, and that ultimately, I think, you know, may impact our partner programs, may impact our events certainly as well. And that's something that we're, that's why I have this March 30th, it's a piece of why I have this March 30th date in my, in my, in my mind as well, is it, it does, it, it could potentially really matter. And so um, I, I think that one important thing to remember, because there's a lot of kind of anxiety from some parents and student athletes that I've spoken with, but it's important to remember that everybody is in the same place, right? All spring seasons are, are suspended, college, every high school that I have seen, travel ball, everything that I've seen so far, like, Everybody is in the same thing. Every coach right now at all levels of college softball are all in a dead period. So everybody is in this together. Everybody's in the same spot. Nobody has some leg up or advantage over somebody else down the road because 
they're doing something else because everything so far is mandated really by the NCAA top down and affects all the member institutions. The other thing is these coaches are going to have to recruit full stop. They, the, there is not going to be a, a scenario in which Harvard softball doesn't feel the team in, tw in 2021. Like that doesn't strike me as a realistic probability. So it's important to keep in mind that yes, we're all in this together and yes, things may look very different, but ultimately all these coaches are going to be on the recruiting trail. It just might be during a different time of year, or they might be doing slightly different things to, to try to get ahead in, in their recruiting, but they're going to recruit a class of 2021. They're going to recruit a class of 2022 at infinitum. They'll, they're going to keep running with this because this is, this is what they do. And Max, I mean, to, to uh, piggyback off of that, there's a, a lot of what coaches are doing now, especially for some of these larger schools, they're recruiting for two, even three years down the line. So we better hope that things are certainly going to be better by, by then. But re realistically, we have to go full, full, you know, full steam ahead, knowing that everything we do is still under that microscope. So the nice thing is everybody's in that same boat, as you said what can we do now that is going to continue to help us? It just may be a shortened period. Instead of having that full year, year and a half, it may just be seven, eight, nine months. Thousand percent. Um, I think that wraps up the, the questions that we have in there right now. Now, this is absolutely not your, your first, last or only opportunity to ask us questions and make sure that we get you, your programs, your student athletes squared away. So always feel free to reach out to Matt, reach out to myself, reach out to our showcase at headfirst.com inbox. If there's anything, anything that we can do for, for you guys as coaches to connect you with the resources that you guys need or your student athletes or your parents, whatever the case may be, always feel free to reach out. We uh, want to be and we love being a resource for the softball community as best we can. So just let us know if there's anything that we can do. And thank you so much for, for taking the time this afternoon to, uh, to talk through some of these questions and ramifications of everything going on. Thanks, guys.